Hello and welcome to the last session for DevWorld. Thank you for coming. <laughs> My name is Judith Klein, as most of you know, and I do a few things. I'm a student at AUT University studying for a Master of Creative Technologies. I work at AUT teaching teachers how to use technology. I work for Prezi as a content designer for Learn and Support, and somewhere in the mix I do some iOS development. If you've been to any of my talks in previous years, uh, you'll know it's something I've been dabbling with for a couple of years now as part of my study and my research. And I've become interested in how mobile devices change the way we interact with the world around us. Mobile devices were, of course, designed to be used while moving around. And most of the time, it's likely that any mobile app will be designed for that kind of environment with that, those kinds of considerations in mind. It is, of course, highly unlikely you'll, you, you will usually be connected to a secondary display um, when you're out and about. But there are some contexts where this is important, and that is what I've started to focus some of my work on. So we've got situations like conferences, obviously, when you're standing talking to a bunch of people, or in the workplace, display information at meetings where there's one person talking to lots of people, and at home if you, to share media and games, and in the classroom for educational purposes, again, typically so someone standing at the front of the room delivering information through the screen. So this talk is called Dual Screen Apps in iOS, and I'm going to cover a few points through this talk. But first of all, I don't know if any of you have used this capability before, or if you've added it to your apps, or if you knew it existed, or if you've ever even thought about it. And as with most of my talks, this is something that I think is really awesome and something that I'm really excited about. And what I hope you'll get out of it is that you'll think it's awesome too and maybe just think of something of integrating to you, your own projects or something you just hadn't thought about before. Besides that, I'm gonna cover what you can do with it, maybe where you've seen it, how you do it, and including some code and why it's important. And more broadly, what six words to think about throughout is design mobile content for static spaces, which is kind of underlining idea. So how it's currently being used, uh, dual screen apps aren't a new thing. If we're all familiar with the desktop paradigm where you connect your computer, you have the option of mirroring completely or dragging things between windows, um, you plug it into a projector or a screen and sometimes you have to push some buttons and try to get it right and get it looking correctly, but, but it works, it's a sense of it and it usually works. It's that behavior that we take for granted with the computer and desktop, that's that option to either mirror or dual screen to be able to select what you show and what you hide. With an iOS device, you can connect through a cable or adapter or wirelessly through AirPlay. And the default for any app, which is just done automatically, is to mirror, as most of you have probably seen. You don't have to do anything at all. However, it's really simple through code to use a secondary display to show secondary content. And there's a few ways to approach this. You can hide components of your UI from the secondary display. This makes sense after all because that's not an interactive surface, so you can't go up and touch user elements, your UI elements. For media apps, you can just stream uh, media content, such as video, while the user can continue to interact with your app on the device. Or you can just show something completely different or something that complements whatever's on your device. And this is more what I'm going to focus on. Simple example, probably seen a few times today, is Keynote. This is something, again, we all inherently understand where it makes sense that you have your presenter's notes, maybe your timing, your next slide, previous slide on your own device because the audience doesn't need to see that and all they see are your presentation slides. This is, what you'd ex oh, no, not um, this is what you'd expect from Keynote, and this isn't always the case with an iOS device because it does behave a bit differently, as obviously you can't do things like drag win windows across, and really it's not, on an iOS device, you're not trying to recreate a desktop experience. When you think dual screen, you typically think presentations, and so you could say, what's the point of connecting my mobile device when I could just use a computer. Why is this important at all? There's a few key differences, and Real Racing HD is, 
re-erasing to HD is the example typically used when demoing this kind of content. Has anyone played this game before? Anyone played it connected to secondary display? Yep, cool, so you'll be familiar with this. Um, so it's, it was the one actually demoed by Apple when they first introduced the AirPlay API. Uh, when you connect to the display, the gameplay shifts to the screen and your own device becomes, has some info on it, and the device actually becomes the controller, so it uses the accelerometer to steer. This is my attempt at playing and videoing it at the same time. Um, so yeah, at a glance you can look down and see what's happening, but your attention is mainly focused on the secondary display, and that's not playing very well. But um, Apple talks a lot, I, I'm not a gamer by any means, and I'm not particularly interested in cars, um, but when I was uh, testing this game for research, um, even I became immersed. Uh, what's important here is that the device, as I said, is the controller, and it utilizes that inbuilt hardware, which is not really something you do with a computer. Apple talks a lot about the iPad becoming one of the most popular gaming platforms, and with applications like this, it's not hard to see why. Another similar example, almost exactly the same, uh, same concept, Ducati Challenge, so if motorbikes are more your flavor, I was quite possibly even worse at this game. Um, same concept, device becomes your steering wheel, the hardware, and the gameplay is shown on the secondary display. Solar Walk and Star Walk are your typical astronomy apps where you can zoom around the sky. And this one, you have a very similar interface on both, both the device and the external display, but it uses the extra space. That's where it shows all the information. So on the iPad, you can just pan and zoom, and then utilizes the gyro to, so you can actually tilt it up and down. Night sky, but then you don't have to crane your neck to see what's, on the, what's actually showing on the screen because you can just see it on the secondary display. A, another good example is a family-friendly Pictionary pass and play style game where you pass the iPad around and all, all everyone sees on the secondary display is the image being drawn and obviously the person drawing can see what they're drawing and it hides the UI elements so it, it brings the focus to the other people in the room to just what's relevant to them and obviously is a key mechanic in actually the gameplay of how that style of game is played. Some apps give you actually control over what you can choose. You can choose what you want to show. PDF Expert is one I use a lot, and so it's quite a practical example I like to use, where you can turn mirroring off completely. Say if you're rummaging through your personal files or entering passwords or setting up network connections, everyone in the room doesn't have to see that. Um, you can mirror completely, so people can see every single UI element if you're actually demonstrating how to annotate a document or important parts of the document, because it's also a PDF annotation tool. Um, or if you're just focused on the document, then all they see is the page that you're on or a page that you choose for them to see. So that one actually has several nice buttons at the bottom where you can pick and choose. And more. There's, so there's a few that you can find, and there's a few articles I found which kind of collate and aggregate good examples of it. But what you'll see is, what a lot of them have in common is that most of them, a lot of them are games, and they work well in this environment because it shares the gaming experience with other people in the room. It goes from being a personal experience to being a shared experience in the shared space with the device as a controller, and this works especially well for multiplayer games where you don't have to clutter up the screen space with everyone, the thing that everyone would see anyway, where everyone, the thing that everyone would see anyway would be on the screen, Everyone just has their personal information on their own devices. And the ability to utilize the touch interface and other hardware controllers is what makes it different from just plugging a laptop in or connecting a laptop. The core idea is that when you connect to a secondary display is because you want to externalize some element of the app into the physical space while maybe hiding others which are not as relevant or sensitive or personal you only show what is relevant to other people in that space. The way to do it is two of the most important things to understand are screens and windows. Um, screens are the physical screen of your dis device or your display, where the UI screen object identifies a physical screen that is connected to the device. Windows are the objects which provide the container for the visible content 
every iOS app has a window. Uh, most of the time, they don't need to access it unless supporting a secondary display. Uh, window objects are, have associated screen object, not the other way around. The window provides a container for the visible content, which I put here twice. Um, and an app's window object is not actually represented in the storyboard. There's a window and screen programming guide which outlines a lot of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I think that's what it's called. And um, when I was programming for multiple displays, something like that. And it outlines some nice diagrams like that. So Apple has, does have very good documentation on this as well. But our, the basics of it are that the physical screen of your iPad is represented by this UI screen object which contains the bounding rectangle of the screen's device. The properties of this screen object are used to create used to create a window where the UI window object provides the container for the visible content. Typically with most apps, you don't need to worry about this, but it becomes important when you're supporting an external display because you have to create one. You can use the screens class method to return an array containing all of the screens which are attached to the device. With the main screen, the one actually in the iPad or the iPhone, will always be at index zero. If you have to text more than one screen, you can get information about that additional screen object and then create an additional window where the information about the bounding rectangle and the UI screen object to create another instance of the UI window at the correct size. Then you associate it with the window with the screen object and show it. A window has a single root view controller object that contains all the other views representing your content. You can then configure your user interface and add views to your windows. And then from there, you just have to, nope, don't do that bit. And then from there, all you have to do is register for screen connection and disconnection notifications to update your views appropriately. Other things you can do to optimize how your content is displayed is you can get information about the configurations actually supported by the external screen because unlike the actual nice screen in your device where we know what size and resolution it is, screens come in lots and lots of shapes and sizes. So you can get information about what that d display supports. And so that is with the available modes property and you select the UI screen mode object corresponding to the desired resolution. You can also set the proper overscan compensation mode to ensure that um, everything you need displayed is displayed appropriately on the screen. So the process before we go to actually look at the code is you check for the presence of an external display. This usually happens at startup. You can create a window, create and configure a window for it, and then you associate the window with the screen object, show it, and update it. Now, now to Xcode, Just because this is actually really easy to do. Do you, is that big? does it need to be that big? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so when you're, so here I've just put it in the, in the view did load, I've done the, I've put in the check for existing screen, initialize if present, and then all I've done in there is all you do is you check how many screens there are, and if there's more than one, all we're gonna do here is we're just gonna log it, and we're gonna create the second the screen for the object index, because zero is the one in the iPad, so the next one will be your secondary one. Create the CG rect, which we can then use to create the screen. And then for now, just to prove that we've detected the display and we can, we're just gonna programmatically change the color and we're gonna show it. And then if there's no screen displayed, we're just gonna log that. Just gonna run that. So if you haven't, wow, that looks very big. Um, so if you haven't actually done anything like this next code before, in the simulator, you can just select under the hardware, TV out and then choose what resolution you'd like. So right now, I've, all I've, I've only done this programmatically, and it's running. And 
that hasn't turned purple. Yeah. So that's running. <laughs> Sorry? There we go. There we go, it worked that time. So it's set it to purple, so I've just done that programmatically and I haven't set up my root view controller, so it's just given me a bit of information there, but it says we've got the external display connected. One thing I've found, which I, I found this in every demo app that I've, when I was looking up how to do this and I haven't found a way around it, that if you do try change this during, while it's running, if you, just, if you try change it, it stops, it crashes, um, and this happens on Apple demo code as well. So you, so I think it's a bug, I'm pretty sure it's a bug. So usually if you do wanna do that, you have to just turn it off and then relaunch it. So while my app's not running, I'm just gonna turn that on again. Both, if you change the screen resolution and if you turn it off or same if you connect or disconnect it. So if you want to test, so the next thing we, Mm -hmm. oh, I think I've gone rid of it now. We can examine and debug later. Um, so what we do now, so we've done that. And then we registered for screen connection, disconnection notifications. So if you do, so you, when you do test those, because currently the way I found crashes in the simulator, you would have to test it on device to make sure that handles the connection and disconnection. And these are all reasonably boilerplate code. You can, it's all in the documentation. Just register for the notifications and then handle them. So usually by creating a screen, if there isn't one already, and if you disconnect, then you just get rid of that. So the other thing we're gonna do here is I've just added some buttons onto my, onto the display, onto the device, just blue, green, blue, green red, and so all we can do, all we're gonna do is just change the background color based on what button is pressed. So very, very simple example. So I'm just gonna run that again. So I can make it blue, green, red. So that's all just doing it programmatically. So all that has been just done in the view controller dot <coughs> So this is also possible to control through storyboards. So you can configure your view just completely programmatically, which is the more common examples that I've found that are the way other people have done it. And, but it is possible to do it through storyboards as well if you prefer to set up your user interface through that. So same process again is you check for existing screens, initialize them pres if present. But when you do that, this time, I've just created a second storyboard file and second view controller for a second screen view controller and the only difference is here is you just create the storyboard and then you make that the root view controller for the second screen and add it to the second window. So all I've done here on my second screen is I've just said that this is my second display. I've just put, I've just put a couple of labels on here. And, and other than that, the code is all still done in the viewcontroller.h file, the, the same one that I did before. And that's all exactly the same. So if we run this now, if I close my previous one, stop that. So if I've done this now, this is the display on the iPhone, and this is the second display. So I've just added a label to each storyboard. This is the iPhone display, which is actually an iPad display, and this is the second display. And so there's just a couple of of labels on each of those, so that's really easy. Let's stop that now. And so the other simple examples, so the first example, it was just a simple press a button, thing changes, but you can start adding some very simple interaction between the, the same way you normally would with just the UI elements on the storyboards. So all I've done is I've just added in a text field and a button, and on my second display, I've just added a label here so when I type something into the, on my iPhone, I can then send it up to the secondary display. So 
I can just say, hello, dev world. Send that with my button. And then on secondary display, yay. Yay. <laughs> so yeah, very simple. So you can do other things which would have been a bit more difficult to, to demo. Um, you could have just done an accelerometer. So I could have, as we saw on the real racing, you can just use the accelerometer value from the device. You can move things around. So that is the, really the core basics of how you create, how you detect a secondary display and start to add content with it, both programmatically and on the story, with, using storyboards. Um, even though that code mostly just uses the very simple information on through all the documentation, I will have a link to all that at the end. Um, currently, all the examples that are that do exist there, you do very do it in a very elaborate way or do not work. So if we go back to this keeps opening things by default, but now why? That's some very simple code, how to do it in Xcode. Oh. So, next. <laughs> that was really hard to do in Prezi. <laughs> so what we're gonna look at now is why do you wanna do this? And the interesting thing, and it's all about the context in which your screen is in. Because as I said before, it's not usually you'll be walking down the street with an iPhone and carrying around a secondary display. I don't know, you might have some weird hobbies. Um, but generally, you won't be. And the mobile device, as we all know, is becoming increasingly, increasingly important, and along with it, reimagining software for the mobile age. I'm sure we've all heard at least one UI and usability talk discussing how to design your app for someone who's out and about and not paying attention and crossing roads about to get hit by cars, um, and so how to design an app for a mobile user. And previously, that was what I was really interested in, of how to utilize um, location awareness, and then what became more interesting for me was actually how to utilize a physical space, so I'm using a mobile device in a physical space. So what we actually have to consider is what environment, so what are these environments where someone will be, where there's a screen where you can connect to? What, think about what is happening in that shared space. What aspect of the content do you want to externalize and show? on the secondary display, and what do you want to hide on the private display? As we open up these new spaces for interaction and collaboration, we open up more spaces for privacy issues. And this was something that was highlighted to me very early when I started bringing in my own Apple TV at university and talking about how this is amazing. Um, and how many times have you sort of been giving a presentation or connected and, oh wait, don't look at my passcode or I'm just gonna enter my password. And it's like, whoops, everyone can see it. And hey, wouldn't it be great if you or your user can control this? So obvious examples, which I mentioned before, in which there are likely to be a screen are at home with the gaming, uh, business and meetings. And the one that I'm most interested in is education, and which is an area that has is gaining a lot of momentum in embracing new technologies. In, in particular, there's increasing interest in uptake of Apple TVs for more than just delivering entertainment content. More and more companies and schools and universities are begin, begin, beginning to introduce them the simple added value of being able to um, be untether, untether the teacher from the lecture and make them more mobile when this doesn't shift anything around that interaction. But, yeah, so it's a simple added value and this works exactly the same for third party software such as Air Server. Um, I work with schools and teachers, and the second you connect wirelessly, it's pure wizardry at its best. Um, even if you do it so very subtly, and then they realize that it's over there and you're over here and there's no cables, and it's just magic. And um, imagine someone going to use your app, maybe something they've used previously, and then it's like, oh, let me show you this, this app. They connect to display, and suddenly they're presented with an interface that's a bit different or is optimize, optimizes the interaction for that space. The other key idea here is collaboration, which is, which is another kind of buzzword or another key idea that everyone's saying these technologies allow us to do is collaborate a lot more in real time. And when you're in a shared space connected to a secondary display, 
again, it's because you want to share something with the other people in that space. But that doesn't respond. It's a one-way interaction. You can send content out there, but it doesn't give you content back. So, and that's very much the paradigm in which the screen currently exists. It's one person at the front of the room delivering content. But if you have multiple, multiple people in the room and people have their own devices, how does that change the interaction? When you can suddenly use that secondary display as a canvas for interaction between the devices in the room, how can you integrate and combine those individual ideas which are shared within a space? How can you capture and externalize that interaction and redesign the content on the mobile device to interact with a static space. They say that these technologies let us work remotely and that we never have to go to the office or attend another lecture or we can all work remotely from bed. But these physical spaces are still relevant when we actually come together and there's someone at the front going blah when in fact there's actually lots of opportunity for everyone to go blah, back. Um, and there's increasingly more frameworks that actually open up more spaces for that engagement. And so there's some great WDC talks. Um, so as uh, Tim talked earlier today, talking about the nearby networking with the multi-peer connectivity, uh, which is something you can you could start combining these frameworks. And uh, the keynote, uh, yesterday, Les mentioned iBeacons, which use Bluetooth LE to create micro-locations even in an indoor space. So what if people come into this space and then it knows who's around and what's there, and then you can seamlessly create that interaction on that, on that plane there. Where if you think about what came before the screen, you had a whiteboard where people could come up and, or blackboard, people could come up and draw on it. So how do you reinvent that with the technology that everyone's using now? And that is why I'm really excited about dual screen apps. And from my experience looking through what's available, I feel like we are just starting to tap the surface. And which is why I hope you guys feel inspired by that as well and think of a way that if it's relevant to what you're doing. Oh, and the, in 2011 was when that AirPlay API was introduced. So they do talk a bit about external displays. So that covers more things like um, over screen comp over scan compensation and preferred modes, uh, but doesn't really cover much about secondary displays, even though it talks about real racing. Some other considerations for utilizing secondary displays, uh, which is a bit of a recap as well, is again, it's just a one-way interaction. And so typically when, right now if you just mirror something, that's still a one-way interaction. And there is the opportunity there to actually change that interaction. Uh, you can use that secondary display to, n not just for interaction, but to offer the control over the public and the private content and make it actually relevant to the people in that space. You can see this display. Don't split the user's focus because something, again, like real racing, you don't need to look down at the display. It's the hardware. Um, so don't confuse the user of where to look. Are they supposed to look up there or look down there? And it's only supported on some of the newer devices but ones we typically only see now anyway, iPhone, iPod Touch with Retina, and iPad 2 and newer. So that's less of an issue now. Oh. So then kind of six words to sum up with is externalized content for engaging immersive experiences. And that's me in many places. There's a link to the code, there's a link to these slides and it's a bit shorter, but it is the last session for the day, this presentation, and so I have time for questions. Thank you. <laughs>